All right, it is two, um, so we will get started. So in case you didn't see the announcement I posted earlier today, um, Blackboard was down most of Sunday. And since some people do do their work on Sunday for the Monday class, um, I just pushed uh, everything back 24 hours that was due today. Um, so it's due Tuesday at two. If you emailed me on Sunday afternoon, um, I probably did not respond to you because I got about 40 emails from all my classes with people freaking out that Blackboard was down, they couldn't do their stuff. So instead of, uh, you know, emailing everyone back, I figured IT would send out an email saying the system's back up or the system's down and they did. So, uh, so I apologize for not answering each and every one of you. All right, so just as a reminder of what we did on Friday, we were looking at DNA and we talked about the double helix features and we talked about some of the biophysical reasons uh, why DNA behaves the way it does and how different conditions can affect how easily DNA separates or not. Um, so we're going to continue talking about DNA today and just a little more review um, that hopefully you should have learned in uh, basic uh, or your other biology classes is talks, talks about the central dogma of biology. And the central dogma of biology is that uh, DNA contain, goes through transcription to make RNA and RNA goes through translation to make protein. And RNA itself will replicate itself uh, every time uh, a cell splits. Of course, there's different types of RNA. You have mRNA, which is uh, gained directly from transcription of the DNA, tRNAs, which will read the mRNA, and with the help of rRNA and ribosome, make proteins. Now we said earlier that DNA is uh, semi-conservative. Um, what that means is that when DNA will replicate, each strand will have one daughter cell and uh, one parent cell or one old, or sorry, not cell strand, or one old strand and one new strand. And we talked about how we have base pairing in DNA. Well, this base pairing allows for um, accurate replication. Since A always goes with T, G always goes with C, if I just give you one strand of DNA, you should be able to accurately replicate it. And that's what organism, organisms do. Um, I will say that this replication isn't perfect though. You do make mistakes. And this, these mistakes uh, allow for mutations and these mu uh, mutations allow for evolution to happen. So to begin with our first question for today, just um, some uh, simple math so we understand Chargaff's rule. So I have a diploid organism. This organism has a haploid genome of 45,000 kilobase pairs. If this haploid genome contains 21% G residues, what number do I have of A, C, G, and T in DNA in each cell of this organism? So a couple minutes, uh, get your brains working, see if we can calculate this, uh, these numbers out, and I'll be back in a, in a minute or two with the answer. As always, if you have questions, let me know.
All right, so let's let's think about this. We have a diploid organism, so just some terminology here. So um, diploid and haploid. Uh, so diploid basically has uh, two copies of a chromosome. Well, the haploid only has one. And so I'm giving you the size of the haploid genome. So I'm saying one half of this organism genome is 45,000 kilobase pairs. Therefore, the total DNA of this organism is 45,000 times two, because it's a diploid, not a haploid. So the total DNA in this organism is 90,000 kilobase pairs. So that's, that's the first thing we need to get out of this problem. What's the difference between a diploid and a haploid? After that, we can start doing some of the math. So how many Gs are there? Well, we have 21% G residue. So all we do is we take our, so this is G, we take our diploid DNA, multiply it by 0.21. Remember, whenever you have a percentage, and you want to actually use that in math, uh, you have to take that percentage and divide by 100. So it'd be 0.21. And so the amount of G in this organism is 18,900 kilobase pairs. And this will be for the amount of C as well, because G equals C according to Shargaff's rule. So that's something else we have to remember for this problem, Shargaff's rule, G equals C. A equals T. So that's how we find out how much G and C there is. Now let's figure out how much A and T there is. So in total, this organism has 90,000 kilobase pairs. And we just said that we have 18,900 G plus 18,000 900 C. So that equation right there is telling us in total how many A's and T residues combined we have. If I want individual amounts, if I wanna know how much A and how much T there is, I just take that number and divide it by two. So that's total DNA minus G DNA or D nucleotides or other uh, G nucleotides or C nucleotides, divide by two to get individual uh, adenosine and threonine, not threonine, uh, thymine amounts. That is 26,100 100 A and T residues. So that's, so this problem really is um, testing you on a couple things. Do you know the difference between a diploid and a haploid. Uh, do you understand Shargaff's rule? And then can you use some basic mathematics uh, to solve a problem like this? All right, so any questions about this type of mathematical problem? All right, if not, we'll go on to today's PowerPoint because this should be the last slide from yesterday, and it is. So let's go to this PowerPoint. Already February, hard to believe. So what we're gonna talk about today and moving forward um, is how we can manipulate DNA uh, in experimentation. So those of you who have taken cell and molecular biology, uh, a lot of this will probably be a repeat for you because bio, uh, bio, biochemistry and cell and molecular biology aren't that different when it comes to experimentation, at least when it comes to growing proteins. It's basically the same thing. Um, so we're going to cover some basic techniques um, how to manipulate DNA to do our experimentation. 
The first thing we're going to talk about are restriction endonucleases. And this is good if you want to sequence DNA or if you want to modify DNA in a controlled setting. There's two different types of nucleases. You have an endonuclease, which will cut inside of a, a DNA RNA strand. So polynucleotide just means RNA DNA. Or an exonuclease, which cleaves at the very terminal residues. Now, we usually want to cut inside of the DNA instead of at the very end. So we use endonucleases in experimentation. So that's what we're going to be worried about here, endonucleases. Got two types. Type 1 doesn't cut at a uh, recognition site. Type 2 cuts at the recognition site. So what's a recognition site or recognition sequence? So these restriction enzymes work by binding on to a certain sequence of DNA, and then they'll make a cut. Type 1 cuts not at the sequence. Your, your nuclease will bind at the sequence, but you're not going to cut. Um, we don't want to use that as biochemists because we want controlled cuts. We want to know what we're cutting at. And with type 1s, you don't. So that's, that's not really good for us. Type 2, though, that is what is good for us because it will cut right at the recognition site or sequence. When you look at these recognition sites, you will see that they are palindromes. Uh, a palindrome is a word that's spelled the same backwards and forwards. Um, one example being race car, right? If you look at race car forward and backwards, it spells race car. Um, the thing is though, and this can be confusing, is that the palindrome itself is within the two strands. So what I mean by that as you can see at the top strand for eco R1, when you go five prime to three prime, it goes G A A T T C. That's the same on the reverse strand going five prime to three prime, G A A T T C. So that, that's what we mean by going in reverse or a palindrome in DNA. It's on two separate strands. It's not in one strand where you go five prime to three and then three prime to five. Remember, DNA has directionality. And so we really care about that directionality. When we're making cuts, we have two types of cuts called a blunt end and a sticky end. And let's, let's take a look at these. Um, eco R1, eco RV or R5 are showing these. So this is a sticky end. This is a blunt end. So what is the difference between a sticky end and a blunt end? So if we look at eco R1, the way we're making the cut, and I'll, I'll draw that out here, is one of our DNA is going to look like this, where you have a full, you have hydrogen bonding pair there, but then you have bases out here that don't have any hydrogen bonding partners. And your second strand is going to be the opposite of that. We have a full hydrogen bond here, but then you have bases floating out in space without hydrogen bonding. That's why this is called sticky, because these bases want a hydrogen bond. And they're just floating without any partners. While in a blunt end, when you make that cut, you don't have any bases that are overlapping. Everything is hydrogen bonded together still. You just made a cut in the DNA. So generally, when you're doing experimentations, you want the sticky end. Because the idea is, I'm going to incorporate DNA into this organism. And the best way to incorporate DNA is if my DNA has a matching overhang. So if the DNA I'm incorporating, right, can hydrogen bond here, now I have a match. And so my DNA will be incorporated. Blunt ends, uh, you want to avoid those if possible. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to use a restriction enzyme that uses a blunt end. 
Um, but you don't have any overhang, so there's no guarantee your DNA is going to want to go in there. You also don't have any directionality, right? If I'm incorporating DNA, and let's say this is five to three, and this is five to three, there's no guarantee it's going to go in this way. It could rotate 180 degrees and insert backwards through a blunt end. With a sticky end, you can't do that. You can't rotate and still insert because you have that overhang that is making sure your DNA is going in the right way. So one other thing to say about the naming schemes of these enzymes, um, they're basically just telling you um, what organism this DNA or this restriction enzyme was found in. So for example, eco means E. coli. So if you look on our table to the left, every time you see the word eco, that's saying the organism came from E. coli. Uh, BG, Bacillus, Globigi. So each of those names just tell you what organism it came from. Um, the letter after that, a lot of the times will tell you the strand. So eco R came from the R strand of E. coli. And the number just means when it was found. So eco R1 is the first restriction enzyme ever found in E. coli R strain. Eco R5 or RV is the fifth strain. So that, that's what the naming system um, for these enzymes mean. So before we move on, is there any questions about uh, any of the information that was presented there? Anything on restriction endonucleases? All right, then, then we can move on. All right, so just so we are comfortable with all the ideas presented there, um, I have a few questions for you. So I have a sequence up there on, on the screen. I want you to tell me if I added TAC1 or TAC-I, what would be my resultant sequence? Then B, after you're done with A, take a look at B, tell me which enzymes would make a sticky end or which enzymes would make a blunt end. Then C, see if you can find any endonucleases that are isoschismers. An isoschismer is simply an endonuclease that cuts at the same sequence, but they're from different organisms. Um, so let's see if we can figure that out. So I'll give everybody a few minutes to work on this, get comfortable with the idea of endonucleases. Um, as always, if you have questions, um, let me know in chat.
All right, hopefully you had some time to get somewhere at least. So we're gonna to start to take a look at these problems. First, sequence cut with TAC1. TAC1 cuts TCGA between the T and the C. Um, one thing to note about restriction enzymes and something that seems to trick up a fair amount of students is that these are always phi prime, the three prime. So for example, if on a test, I did something like give you T, C, G, A like this, and I asked the question, does TAC1 cut there? The answer would be no, because five prime to three prime, this sequence is A, G, C, T. So just be aware of that. And also a question that I usually get is, do we need to memorize restriction enzyme sequences? Uh, no, you do not. If I ask you any question with a restriction enzyme, I will give you um, like a table or I'll tell you what it cuts. All right, so we are cutting five prime, three prime TCGA between the T and the C. So TCGA right here, then reverse TCGA. So that would be our cut. Um, so the products would be five prime AC whoops, that's a C, A, C, G, T, three prime, T, G, C, A, G, C, then, and that's a three prime right there, and that's a five prime right there. And then your other sequence would be five prime, C, G, A, A, T, C, three prime, five prime, G, A, uh, T, T, three prime. So when you make a cut, you are making new five prime and three prime n. So don't forget that as well. So there's A and then B. Are we dealing with blunt ends and sticky ends? Um, so I'm gonna do B for blunt as for sticky. And the idea is if you're making an even cut, that is you have the same nucleotides on each side, uh, that's gonna be a blunt end. If you don't, that's a sticky end. If you don't make an even cut, you're gonna have overhang. So blunt, sticky, sticky, sticky. Here, we're cutting at the very end. When you cut at the very ends like that, again, it's gonna be a blunt end because you don't have any overhang. So that's blunt and blunt, sticky, blunt, sticky, 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 blunt, sticky, sticky, sticky. So you're just asking yourself, Am I making an even cut or an uneven cut? Uh, even cut will make no overhangs. Uneven cut will make overhangs. And the last one, isoschismers. Isoschismer are a pair that cut at the same recognition site. HPA2 and MSP1 are isoschismers. They both cut at CCGG. All right, so is there any questions uh, about these problems or anything about endonucleases in general? The cut is after the TY. Um, because if you go on the table for TAC1, that's what it's showing. Um, the arrow is showing you where the cut is. So that's just saying it happens between the T and the C. That's how the enzyme works. Uh, any other questions? All right. So we've looked at cutting DNA. Now let's look at how we can sequence DNA. And we're gonna start with a technique that's been around like 50 years now, um, developed in the 70s. And although it's old and can't do big 
genome DNA, it's still used on a regular basis today because it's good at reading small amounts of DNA and it's super efficient. It's called the chain terminator sequence uh, method. And it's developed by uh, Frederick Sanger. Uh, Sanger is a big name in the field of DNA, um, developed a lot of technology. So when you, when you look back at, um, you know, how science started, especially with DNA, Sanger names popped up a lot. So let's take a look at the chain terminator sequence method. Uh, step one, you need a single polynucleotide strand. So you need to take your double stranded DNA, melt it, to get single-stranded DNA. And this is usually done by heating. Um, so you heat it up to melt it. Heating doesn't break bonds unless you're at super high temperature. Well, let me take that back. It doesn't break covalent bonds. When you're heating, you're breaking hydrogen bonds only. Um, that's also a common thing that I see people get wrong. Um, they think that when you heat a little bit, you're breaking covalent bonds. And that's not true. You have to heat something very hot, hundreds of degrees to start breaking covalent bonds. Um, melting DNA, you're talking about like uh, seven, uh, 70 degrees Celsius. That's not enough to um, break covalent bonds. All right, so once you have your DNA separated, what you do then is add unlabeled DNTPs and labeled DDNTPs. So what does this word mean, uh, DNTP? So the, the N nucleotide TP triphosphate D stands for deoxy or DNA. Um, so like your ATP, TTP, CTP, GTP. When we talk about labels, we're talking about like a fluorescence label. So unlabeled don't have anything on there. Then we have a terminator DDNTP. So both of these stand for deoxy or you could say double or dideoxy um, or double deoxy. So normally DNA is only deoxy on the three prime. DD NTPs are uh, deoxy on the two prime. And what this does is that this will stop DNA elongation. When DNA is added, um, or when you're making DNA, it is always added to the three prime position. So you're gonna add a new base to the three prime position. And to add a new base, you need OH at the three prime position. That's what the chemistry is. You, you are adding a phosphate and removing, and you need that OH to do that. If you don't have that there, you can't add anything past that. And that's actually a really brilliant idea because what you do is that you have these separated DNA strands. You add polymerase, which will um, grow your DNA and you add your primer so you have something to start with. And the idea is that each one of these DDNTPs have a different fluorescent dye attached to them. So in our example to the right, C is blue, T is red, G is yellow, A is green. Then you just run this a bunch of times. And by random chance, if you've run this enough, you'll have a terminator stop at one nucleotide um, increments. So let's say I ran this like 10,000 times, right? By chance, if I ran this 10,000 times on this DNA strand, so on my template DNA strands, my, my opposite strand would have a fluorescence on A once or multiple times, G, T, T, G, C, T, A, C, C. I was just reading down there. 
And these are all separate strands. So every time you add a fluorescence, the reaction stops, right? Because you can't continue after that. So you need to do many, many, many repetitions of this and you'll get a lot of DNA strands. And what you do is that you can separate DNA based on their size. And so they will separate out in one nucleotide um, differences. You, we, like scientists can separate DNA based on one nucleotide. That's not hard at all. And then what you do is you shoot a laser at it and you see based on the detector what fluorescence tag you have. So when this laser goes through this gel, it will read, okay, so my sequence after my primer goes C, C, A, T, so on and so forth. And you can sequence your DNA now. This works good for DNA that's a couple of hundred nucleotides long uh, because the longer your nucleotides, um, the less chance you will have to actually read it all. Um, because again, this is all by chance. So if I have a nucleotide that I want to sequence that's like 10,000 nucleotides long, the chance when I do this chain terminator sequence that I'll have a stop point everywhere between three and 10,000. Like, so I stop after three nucleotides, I stop after four nucleotides, five nucleotides, all the way to 10,000 nucleotides. Like I have a, a fluorescence at every single one in a separate reaction. The chances of that are like zero. But if you're only talking about like 400 nucleotides, you can run this enough by brute force and get the sequence of what you want because of this method. All right, so I'm sure that was a little confusing. I know the first time I, I learned about this, I, I wasn't quite sure like exactly what was going on. Um, so is there any questions about uh, what I went over there? the logic of this chain terminator sequence method or anything uh, that people are still unclear about that you'd like me uh, to talk more about. All good. All right, so if you are typing on a question, feel free to continue, but since I don't see any right now, I'll move forward. So when you do the chain terminator sequence, this is the output you get. You get this in an email. Um, and you can see we have a bunch of random peaks there, right? Um, these, these peaks are the fluorescence signal we got. Um, and there, and you can see if you look at certain peaks, let me point one out for you, uh, around about 120. We have a blue peak and underneath it, we have a little baby uh, green peak. Basically the height of the peaks tell you probability that we're certain, we're certain that that nucleotide is there. So maybe at position 120, we're like, uh, we're 95% certain that's a C. There's a like maybe 5% chance we got that wrong. It's probably even lower than five. That's probably 1%. Um, but right now we're looking at a sequence of about 300 nucleotides. When you look at these and you get further out, that's when like all the peaks start getting the same height because you, there's just too much error, too much noise that we don't know for sure. So that's an actual readout of the chain nuclear uh, chain terminator sequence method. So, so let's take a look at this and see if we can pick out any information or pick out some certain information. So at positions 130 to 150, I think my sequence should go A, G, C, T, C, C, A, G, C, T, 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 C, T, T, C, 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 T, T. Yeah, hope you enjoyed my reading of that. Do you see that sequence? between 130 and 150. If not, what do we call that change? 
So let's, so I'll give people like 30 seconds. Take a look at that. See if it matches up. And can someone tell me if it doesn't match up? What do we call that? And what position does it not match up at? Because the way I phrase that question, yeah, it doesn't match up. So did anyone spot where the error is yet? Between 130 and 150. The G after 140? Yeah, so position 143. Um, so this T is 140, so 141, 142, 143. So nucleotide 143, that should be a C, but it's a G. So something went wrong there. And from your biology classes, what do we call that something again? Who remembers their vocab? Point mutation, exactly. This is a point mutation where one nucleotide changed. Um, so this type of thing is actually common in uh, uh, MCB labs, molecular cell biology and biochem labs. Um, usually when you work on new DNA or if you're incorporating DNA into an organism or making a new plasmid, and we'll talk about plasmids in a few lectures. One of the first things you need to do is one, you need to check that the DNA you think you're working with is still perfect. And so it is not uncommon for you to get a chart like this and to do a, a, a nucleotide by nucleotide scan to see, okay, is this DNA what I think it is? because many experiments have been ruined by people not doing this step, going throughout the whole experiment, getting some weird result that they can't explain, going back to their DNA sequence and seeing, oh, there was a mutation there. The protein I was growing is different than what I thought it was. Um, so that's, that's something to always be diligent about. Um, B, we're not going to do B like together. That's just if you want more practice using restriction endonucleases uh, on a real target, um, you can go through here and make the cuts and see what you get. And I'll post um, online with the answer sheet, like what are the cuts that should be there. Um, but yeah, for right now, we're going to skip that. But any any questions about chain terminator sequence or anything up to this point. All right, so we'll move on then. So chain terminator sequence is the slow method still used, still good for um, lower amounts of nucleotides. But what if I want to sequence a genome? What if I want to sequence 3 billion base pairs? That's where next gen sequencing comes in. And we're going to talk about um, some of the popular next gen sequencing methods. First one is called pyro sequencing or 454 sequencing. And I'm sure my letters are cut at the bottom, so I'll just 
uh, rewrite them. All right. So here is how next gen sequencing works for the pyro sequencing method. You take DNA fragments. So um, you take an organism and you cut up their DNA using endonucleases. And you just make a ton of cuts. You just chop it up really, really good. You then attach these DNA fragments to plastic beads. Um, basically one DNA molecule per plastic beads. Then you take these plastic beads and you're gonna replicate the DNA on these beads. Um, it, it, it is, um, during this experiment, you will have plastic beads that have the identical DNAs on them. Um, this is a way to just make sure uh, we have repetition in our experiment, that the results we're seeing, if we see it multiple times, we can be rather confident in what we're seeing in the results. So the way this works is that you have your DNA on a plastic bead. You add, your, you add a primer, a DNA primer, so you have some place to start with. So these, these black lines, right? These are the primer. So um, right here is like the primer. And this other black line that's already on the bead, that's just like junk DNA to match up to the primer, which you're going to stick your real DNA onto. Then, once you have that set up, you're going to add DNA polymerase one, and only one type of nucleotide at a time is added. So, let's say you start with T. You're going to add to your plastic beads only T trinucleotides. And then you're gonna add, add in your polymerase. And if you start with A, and that's actually the sequence we're, we're making on the picture to the right, it's the same image as the picture on the left. So that's a good way to follow along. So we add our Ts, we let the polymerase do its thing. And then we will start a reaction because when we add a nucleotide, we go from a NTP and MP. So we release PPI. Uh, PPI is called pyrophosphate. And it's just two phosphates that are connected together. So if you ever wonder what uh, pyrophosphate is, PPI, it's, it's that molecule. So that's released when we add a nucleotide to growing DNA. This PPI interacts with the enzyme luciferase. Um, luciferase is an enzyme that just creates light. That's what it does. And so we can measure this. So we add all Ts and we measure the light that's coming off. And we can see if Ts were added. And we can actually see the intensity of light. So we can actually say how many Ts were added. Once that reaction is done, we wash away all the Ts and then we add a nucleotide and we see if there's any flashes of light. You can see in our um, setup on the left here that when we add A, there's no flashes of light. That's because our template DNA, which is again is shown on the right hand side, goes AAC. So if we add A's, a is not going to bind to C, so nothing happens. No flashes of light. So then we wash away all the A. Then we add our G nucleotide, and we get one flash of light because the residue was C, so G is added. Wash G away. Add Cs. Nothing happens. Repeat the process. And you do this. T to A to G to C, repeat the T until your DNA is sequenced. And so since you have a lot of plastic beads that you're doing to this at the very same time, you can sequence like a million beads at once. It's incredibly fast, a roughly a thousand times faster than chain terminator method. So this is one of the reasons why we can now sequence a whole genome in like 24 hours. We can just do a lot of reads in a very short amount of time. All right, so is there any questions about the logic of the pyro sequencing method? All 
All right. So let's go to Illumina sequencing now. Uh, Illumina sequencing and pyrid sequencing, a lot of them have the same ideas. Uh, you have DNA that's this time attached to a glass plate instead of a plastic bead. Um, you're gonna, uh, on these plates, you're gonna amplify. And so you have millions of identical DNAs. To these DNAs, you add a primer, like we saw previously, polymerase one and DNTPs with different fluorescent tags are added. Um, so this is a little different than pyro sequencing. Pyro sequencing, we didn't have tags. Aluminum, we do have fluorescence tags. Um, and in case you're not quite sure what the word tag means in terms of like biochemistry, it's kind of like what the word implies where we have our nucleotide and then we just have like something that a fluorophore that, that glows if you shoot it with a certain amount of light. So it's just kind of like sticking on to our nucleotide there. So what we do here is that we have our sequence and then this time we add all four nucleotides at once. So previously we were only adding one type of nucleotide. In Illumina, we add all four at the same time. And what is different here is that no matter what, only one nucleotide will add at a time. So we have the same sequence as we were looking at previously with pyro sequencing goes AA. However, when we add all four nucleotides, only one T is added. And so what happens is that after time is given for that nucleotide to add, we shoot it with a laser and we see what color of light was given off. Um, here, green is given off. And I've got to mention, um, you wash all the other nucleotides away. So anything that's not attached will not be hit by a laser. So you wash all the nucleotides away, you hit your DNA with laser, see what color comes out. It's green. So the computer will say, okay, that residue is a T. Repeat, add all four nucleotides, let attach, wash away, hit it with a laser, green, so on and so forth. Um, you do that until your nucleotide, your DNA sequence is finished. Um, so here, like, um, like the chain terminator sequence, this method's only good for short DNAs, you know, 30 to 300 nucleotides. But per run, you can do this 3 billion times at once. So it's pretty scalable. Um, you can get a whole organism done, like I said, within a day, no problem, just with the massive number of reads. So any questions about the Illumina sequencing method? All right. And if, since, so this is the end of our time. And I'll just say, if you want, you can get your whole genome sequence for like $1,000. It's pretty cheap now. Uh, just be aware that um, if you have committed any crimes that you have not been caught for yet and you left your DNA at the crime scene, you might be caught because apparently the cops can just get those sequences. Um, at least that's what's happened before. I don't know if they're still doing that, but I remember reading that story and it was like, yeah, makes sense. But anyways, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I'll put up a homework. Um, as always, if you have questions during the week, please do not hesitate to email me. Um, just as a reminder, because the Blackboard's issues, the stuff that was due today is due Tuesday by two. So make sure you do that if you haven't done that yet. Otherwise, I have nothing left for you for today. So hope you all have a good rest of your day. And hopefully I will see you Wednesday. Take care, everybody.